Welcome to Wellness Wednesday and the Chronic Wellness Radio Show. I'm your host, Sandra Silva, and it is so fantastic to be here with you again today on Wellness Wednesday. And it's where you get to hear a variety of voices and viewpoints, all relating to topics on how to live a healthier, happier, more thriving life. Well, will you listen to that? I am back with my original intro music, the music that I would play at the beginning of each show when we were recording back in studio. I will have to say that I have missed it a little bit, uh, so it's nice to have that back again. This is, however, live content that you are listening to right now, whether you are listening to this on CHLY Community Radio or wherever you find and listen to your podcasts. I would like to welcome you to today's Chronic Wellness Radio Show and the Chronically Driven Podcast podcast. I've been doing the radio show for two and a half years now, covering a wide range of topics. They all, however, have an ongoing theme of how to be in pursuit of wellness, chronic wellness, as I like to to call it. And as a reminder, we do not need to be chronically ill to want to be chronically well. Chronic is simply something that is ongoing and constantly reoccurring. Ongoing wellness and finding ways to support our physical and emotional health is something that is of value to us as individuals and as a community at large. We are in all of this together. If you do happen to have a chronic condition, you are among the 40 to 44% of the general population that experiences the same. Chronic disease, illness, or pain is a common occurrence and not only impacts individuals, but their families. I think that part of being able to live well with a chronic condition is being able to talk about our experiences and share and learn from one another. So let's get started. I've been collaborating with Arthritis Research Canada this year with an educational series called Arthritis Wellness Conversations. This month's topic is pregnancy and parenting. And I feel it's an important conversation to listen to as it touches on the science, the physical and the emotional aspects of navigating pregnancy and parenting when having a chronic condition. Thank you for joining us for another arthritis wellness conversation. My name is Sandra Sova, and as always, I am joined by a research scientist from Arthritis Research Canada. Joining us today is Dr. Mary DeVera. And we also, as always, have members of the Arthritis Patient Advisory Board. Joining us is Allison, Eileen, and Trish. Today's topic is pregnancy, parenting, and living with arthritis. We have a few different perspectives on the panel today, so let's just jump right in and start the conversation. Dr. DeVera, what are some of the issues that women with arthritis tend to face in pregnancy? So I guess, first of all, I think this is such an important topic um, because, you know, arthritis is so misunderstood. It, people tend to think of it as a disease of older people, when really it does impact across all ages and it impacts women, especially. So it impacts their ability to be able to get pregnant and to have um, safe pregnancies. So um, one of the issues right now is whether um, women should take medications or not. Arthritis is itself a risk factor for many pregnancy complications. So it's not a matter of, you know, when a a woman who doesn't have a chronic disease, when they get pregnant, they tend to not take medicines, you know, they they don't eat sushi, they don't drink. So, you know, like the, the recommendations are clear. But for women with arthritis, not taking medications could actually be harmful. So that's actually one of the biggest issues that we study in our research. Absolutely. And, you know, as things have changed and there's so much value that goes on with research in the area of arthritis, I know that when I was in my mid-20s, I was told rather, rather matter-of-factly by a rheumatologist that I really should consider not becoming pregnant and starting a family because of my rheumatoid arthritis. That was 30 years ago, mind you. Is that something that anyone on the panel had been, has been advised not to have children? I was advised that when I started some of my biologics to definitely not get pregnant on them because there would be some severe reactions. 
And I've also been advised to not have regular forms of birth control that a healthy woman could have because I'm at increased risk for blood clot or stroke. So that kind of really changed my opinion on having another child since I was diagnosed after my son's birth. But when I asked my rheumatologist right after I was first diagnosed, I said to her, I was like, can I have another child? And she was very honest with me and said, you can, but most women only have one. And I think I understand that now it's because it would be so hard on my body now. So I am not right now. I'm not, there's, I'm not even thinking about having kids, but it is in like something I'd like to do in the future. Um, and I was diagnosed so young. So basically, so I was diagnosed at three and I've been on medications all my life. So, and it ranges from like methotrexate to a biologic to there's a stint where I was um, treating chronic pain with opiates. And so all of these have come into factor of like, how is my body going to react to having a kid? And like, will I be able to to get pregnant and things like that? But also, so my doctor hasn't said that I can't have or shouldn't have children. She did say that I need to give her at least a year to 18 month warning so that I can come off some of my medications. But there is that fear too, is like with the biologic is it is technically safe from what she said, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, how, how much do we know about it and how it affects 50 years down the road since they haven't been around that long. It's just a fear in my mind, but I don't know. So there's a lot, definitely a lot to consider or that I have considered. That's another reason why having a really good, strong relationship and communication with your healthcare provider is is important for someone like Allison to be able to plan and to think about these things and and the big picture. Absolutely. And actually, that's some of the things that we're finding is to actually have that conversation early, even if, you know, pregnancy is still years down the road, but just to kind of, you know, have that check-in so that, you know, you can plan for birth control and then to also give the enough lead time to be able to plan, you know, what medications you could stay on um, when you're conceiving and then what medications you can stay on when you're pregnant. So um, that is definitely uh, one thing that we found so that, you know, um, some, some women that we've talked to or interviewed said, you know, they haven't had that type of like relationship. They haven't felt supported in their decisions. We've also found some women that, you know, have had those relationships that, you know, they were able to carry the pregnancy successfully and then transition into motherhood and then also plan for that subsequent pregnancy. So, so actually some of the things that we're working on findings is tailoring that messaging to patients, but also to the healthcare providers, because we want the conversation to come from both sides. So it's not always patients having to go ask their doctors. It should also be the doctors offering and just, you know, initiating those conversations. Mm -hmm. And then I guess I wanted to add um, to Allison's concerns about like biologics. So I guess it's a little bit of um, good news or some of the reassuring things that we've found. So we've been studying biologic. Oh my gosh for the past seven years since I started uh, my appointment as an assistant professor. Cause yeah, at that time they had just been in the market for just over 10 years. We really needed to understand, you know, what are their impacts on the moms and the babies when they're taken during pregnancy. So over the past three years, we've actually published a series of papers where we've shown that they're not as with a lot of the adverse outcomes that we tend to worry about with medications and pregnancy. So there's no association with preterm births. There's no association with small for gestational age babies. And there's no association with congenital malformation. So that's a major thing that people worry about, especially when you consider that, you know, some um, arthritis medications like methotrexate are actually teratogenic. And then there's no action with infections in the mom and infections in the baby, which is, again, is an important potential complication considering how these drugs work. So yeah, so some reassuring research that uh, we've published. And again, we're working a lot on how do we take these findings and communicating them so that patients are aware and also that doctors are aware that, you know, we have found that there are no associations with these um, complications. One of the things that I was curious is, does having arthritis impact a woman's fertility or her ability to conceive? Yes. So studies have shown that it does. So women with arthritis tend to have less children compared to women um, who don't. And they also take a longer time to be able to conceive. So again, this ties back to just that that relationship and conversation with the healthcare provider so that pregnancy and um, reproductive decisions can be planned ahead of time so that they can, um, we can have successful outcomes. 
thinking about when you do have arthritis and you are going through a pregnancy, did your arthritis change while you were pregnant? I wasn't actually diagnosed quite yet when I was pregnant. I started experiencing symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis around 24, but it was during my pregnancy that I could tell something was definitely wrong with my joints. And I've never experienced such horrible swelling in my, well, in my existence since, but I might with RA. And it was after my pregnancy that I had to see my doctor and ask to be tested for rheumatoid arthritis. It just came so apparent that something was really wrong with me. What about you, Trish? Yeah, so um, I have a little bit of different story. I've been, I was diagnosed with osteoarthritis. I was one of those um, 22-year-olds that had a sports-related injury and had surgery, and my surgeon said that I would get arthritis. But at 22, I only knew arthritis to be an older person disease. So I was thinking, oh, I'd get it in 60s or 70s or whatever. But in my 30s, when I was pregnant, the last trimester, everything just, so the swelling, the joint stiffness, the pain, everything just exacerbated. And it was really difficult. And I thought it was part of pregnancy. And I didn't think of it as arthritis because I didn't, I had some symptoms before pregnancy, but a lot of them we were written off by my GP or other healthcare professionals as my sports injuries. They were sore muscles or affiliated with my impact with badminton or skiing. So we really didn't know I had arthritis. But after pregnancy um, and after delivering, my symptoms didn't go away. They actually got worse and we got x-rays and the x-rays were the ones that told me that I had arthritis because it was, you know, very visible on x-rays. But um, I'd say the pain, the inflammation and the joint stiffness, the changes in my center of gravity and that ligament changes in your last trimester. I think beforehand my muscles were really strong. And maybe that's why I didn't have all the symptoms showing because I was very athletic. My muscle strength was there. But after the pregnancy, the muscle atrophy, the muscle weakness, just everything changed. For me, it was post really, that last trimester and post pregnancy that I really found out I had arthritis and then having to adapt to that new life. And is that something that you it, you typically hear, Dr. Devera, that arthritis is coming on a little bit stronger during and post-pregnancy? So I guess along the same lines, when, uh, you know, when we started the conversation that there's these just misconceptions before. So, you know, in your experience, you were told that you couldn't get pregnant or you were advised not to get pregnant. So um, I guess, interestingly, there's been also like this longstanding thought that RA goes into remission during pregnancy. So for the longest time, you'll also hear people getting said like, you know, get pregnant because that's your RA will go into remission. But actually that has been, you know, evidence has since come along that that's not in fact not true. So I actually have some numbers. So um, at least um, under half will continue having active disease during pregnancy. So again, that's why it's important to, you know, have that plan and be able to consider the medications that are compatible with pregnancy, because now there's evidence for these medications. And then about 20% will actually experience a moderate to severe disease activity, uh, particularly during um, the third trimester. And then um, speaking to what Trish mentioned, about 40% will experience at least one postpartum flare. So it is like a disease that will continue progressing even during that perinatal period. What sort of challenges does having arthritis bring to your role of parenting? Well, I think for me, just adapting my lifestyle I wasn't able to be physically as active as I wanted to be. And so I had to choose what I could do and focus on the positive aspects. And, you know, I was able to read with him. I was allowed to be able to play board games or do other types of activities that I wasn't involved in running or high impact sports. I did push through for a few years when he was a kid, I actually, because I'm a skier, um, I wanted him to learn how to ski. So I thought in my mind, I would be able to ski the green runs and ski with him for a couple years while he's learning. Well, not even three times, he's already down the hill and I'm trying to keep up with him. So I knew that I wouldn't be able to ski with him very much longer. And I knew that every time I skied, I would pay the price for a couple days. So I would sacrifice to be able to have that moment. 
you know, that time with him and those memories. So it was tough having to give up throwing the softball or his baseball, you know, being participant in his physical activities. But, um, you know, there was other things we could do. So we had to modify kind of my first six, seven years of having my arthritis. And then he was a little bit older and then he understood. And I think that's another thing is my son is very empathetic, um, very compassionate because he's seen me on my good days as well as the days that I struggle. So I think that is kind of a cool thing that he's learned through mm -hmm. this whole process. Sorry, I'm getting a little teary-eyed because I always kind of think of what I've had to give up, you know? And I'm still funny, he's grieving who I was or who mm -hmm. I thought I was. So as a mom, my role might've been a little different than my sister-in-laws or my girlfriends. Um, but we figured it out. We figured it out. Thank you. That's really, that's really touching. I mean, that's really going straight to my heart, Trish. And it, it, we did a study where we interviewed women with RA and some of the themes just reflected what you just said. So they've had to make a lot of adjustments. So even um, things like being able to breastfeed. So for some of the moms that had a lot of hand or wrist involvement, they said they just couldn't breastfeed because they couldn't hold the baby. And then they also told us about just some of the baby items like car seats could be really hard yeah. on hand. So there was a lot of like relying on the partner and family. And then yeah, just, um, just adapting their activities. So yeah, they can't do a lot of the physical activities, but then they will just do a lot of reading. And then the, um, what you just said about your son being empathic. So one of the, I guess, beautiful things that we came out with at this research was a lot of the moms told us that their children are a lot more empathic, a lot more sensitive. They're so kind because they've seen what their moms go through. So um, yeah, I feel like I'm going to tear up because you just, just really just brought our research to life with what you just shared. Absolutely. Eileen, I know that you are a blogger. And one of the things that you started focusing and talking about is being a, a parent of a young child and rheumatoid arthritis. Well, particularly with rheumatoid arthritis, it is one, one of the diseases that definitely causes disability for a lot of people if they don't get treated in time. So I think one of the biggest challenges for me personally has been a single parent getting by on disability. And it's not just the financial aspect of that, but also because I am... A single parent, I'm all on my own. So it's dealing with all the chores of and everything that comes with raising a child from birth till he's almost eight now. So I've been going through pretty much his entire childhood um, and watching my body slowly change each time, you know, each year as my disease progresses. So it can get challenging in different ways each year. And as he grows, particularly when he was a baby um, before I was diagnosed wearing a baby sling was really kind of something I wanted to do because I had hand and wrist pain. So I thought, well, maybe I could just wear him, but even just wearing him was too painful. I couldn't have 20 minutes just wearing him. And I remember feeling like I wasn't like the other moms. And then I felt like I missed out on so many opportunities and I couldn't breastfeed too because of pain, but I wasn't diagnosed yet in that a lot of people are breast is best, but when you're dealing with an illness, it's not necessarily breast is best. It's as long as your baby gets fed and what helps a mom be able to be the best parent she can be and take care of her illness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Allison, you're not, um, as, you, as we know, you're not yet a parent, but you mentioned that you do think about how to balance everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, right now I'm lucky because my, arthritis is generally pretty controlled with medication. And so I am still able to work and I'm working from home right now. And so there's those, but that idea is like the, the balancing and like, how do you, at what age does your child understand what you're dealing with? Or like, and at what age can you start having these conversations with your kid and, and feeling like they're hearing you and that, that like, yeah, your parent parenting is a bit different, but that they like, and so that there's not that like resentment or anger or like, do you have to, have you had to deal with that? Like for as parents, like dealing with your kid or not being able to take them to the park or not being able to take them on a hike or something like that, like, 
or do they understand or did you guys have you guys found that they've understood the younger he was the less he understood but the older he gets the more he understands and also the more in depth with my diagnosis I get I find ways to balance going to the park and life so has it gotten easier yes and no as Trisha said like my son has grown into being such an understanding uh empathetic and compassionate little guy for somebody who's not even eight yet and I know that it's my diagnosis that has taught him this and that would be something that I wouldn't be able to give him if I didn't have this diagnosis so it's always important for my mental health is to find that silver lining. And I think that's probably the biggest one for me. I think also we need to look at um, not trying to do it yourself and be a super mom because I felt guilty that I couldn't be there for him like I wanted to. So I actually finally started talking to friends and family and explaining what I was going through. And they had no idea because I had hidden it for so long. Because I was one of those tough, you know, independent athletes that no pain, no gain, just push through it. And, you know, and I thought, I finally got to a point that I started asking people to go to for walks with me or go to the playground with them and their kids. So I wasn't alone in case of an emergency or something happened that I felt uncomfortable with. I always had somebody who understood and said, oh, well, Trisha, I'll go get him. He's just, you know, gone on the slide or something, or they would help out. So I think the one thing for me as a parent was learning how to ask for help, not feeling that I was a failure as a mom. And then knowing that we had a community. And I always think, you know, they have that saying about it takes a community to raise a child. Well, if you have arthritis, it really takes a community to raise a child. And it's nice knowing that my family and even some of my close friends stepped up and they didn't even bat an eye that they kind of took over some areas that I had difficulty with. And then there was a couple years when Jackson was little and I was battling depression. I don't remember some of his baseball season. I don't remember some of the activities, but I had family that would take him to baseball or, you know, join in when I'm there just to keep me engaged and keeping me part of the whole um, activity and stuff. So I think building a community is really important when you have arthritis and especially when you're raising a kid. There's, there's such good and important and valuable information being shared here. I love hearing the correlation between having a mom who has some challenges such as arthritis and having that translate over to raising more compassionate and understanding young people. And hopefully in turn, future generations will be will be more open in talking about these things. Trish, I can relate so much with that, putting on that, that facade and that armor of things being okay and that we can do it. I think that having conversations like this is empowering and encouraging that it is a normal part of many people's lives and that we should talk about it. We need to normalize all the different types of situations that are happening and that we can normalize these types of conditions and lifestyles and get support for one another because that is so, so important. And that's where we have much better outcomes for both our physical and our mental and emotional wellness. I think one other area that you don't think about, but when you're raising a child, um, also you have a spouse. Um, sometimes um, for me is I had to learn how to change up intimacy so a lot of things were different after my arthritis diagnosis and having a young child a lot of things change because if you're in pain and everything it's hard to kind of be in the same role that you were in before and learning new ways of connecting with your significant other and I think that was also another challenge for me in those early years was you have a new baby, you have a new diagnosis of arthritis, and you're trying to juggle everything and you don't want your spouse or significant other to be left out of the picture. Um, so that was a hard juggle as well. So I don't know if people talk about that 
being a new mom, but that was one of the other areas that I forgot I dealt with back then or had to kind of figure out a new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. so um, so it's interesting. So, uh, you know, when we were, so from some of those interviews, they actually brought in the roles of their partners and that actually inspired us to do a spin-off study where we interviewed the partners because they really wanted to share their own experiences and, and some of the stuff that they've shared, some of the stuff that have come out of that, those interviews were actually also very um, insightful. So, you know, they want to be involved. So um, some of them felt that, you know, the wives, Again, we're trying, or the partner, sorry, not, not all of them are married, but they're, you know, their partner with the RA were trying to be strong, but the, the male partner, all males, wanted to help, but they found out like the woman was almost trying to like just, you know, still be, you know, the woman, they don't, they didn't want to like let their disease like take over the relationship. So the men want to help. And then we also found that they also were processing and their own mental health were also being impacted by watching their partner deal with disease, deal with pregnancy, deal with motherhood. So, you know, some of our recommendations from that is, you know, to have more involvement. Um, one of our um, rheumatologist collaborators, um, when, because we're now um, looking at the paper, we're about to submit it. She said, you know what, this actually reminds me to invite the partners to the appointments and not just the, the patient. So yeah, partners have an important role. For sure. And they've kind of been neglected or, you know, so I think we also need to recognize that they also need care. That's a really good point. I guess if I could add a couple more things. Um, so it, it, I, I guess just some more words of reassurance that we know a lot more about arthritis and pregnancy now than we ever did. And there's actually even more guidance. So in 2016, um, the European League Against Arthritis and Rheumatism, their recommendations. In 2018, the American College of Recommendations published the recommendations. So there's guidance for healthcare providers and there's evidence for you know, the safety of medications. So I guess now we're kind of bringing up the other end is you know, talking to the patients to see are these new guidance, are these new recommendations kind of filtering down to their care? And you know, if there's gaps, so how can we bring it? Because yeah, if there's evidence and information, they need to get to the healthcare and they need to get to the patient so that they can make reproductive decisions that they feel comfortable and confident in. Because I think that's ultimately what's gonna support a healthy pregnancy and a healthy you know, parent, parenting and family life. Adapting around the house, you know, when he was little, you know, you're given a lot of things that are very difficult to manage and work with. And I think for me, the biggest thing was the stroller because I could walk. I couldn't do a lot of other activities, but I made sure that the stroller was ergonomically friendly, easier on my body, the right height. So I wasn't in a position that would put more stress on my joints, modified a few things and made them a little higher. So it was easier for me to get him out of the crib then you know if it's too low and stuff so i think looking at a few different things um that you can do things you just have to modify them so not just mentally or physically for my body but er ergonomically around mm -hmm. the house adjusting things you know and for bathing i had difficulty getting down and kneeling and bathing so we had to figure out another thing in the sink or get another bath um kind of basin and stuff so we had to look at a variety of different things to make sure that I could still do those things um, that didn't put more stress on my joints and then also too is um, looking at some of the other things for me is um, the height of some of my chairs so if I was holding him and stuff it was easy for me to get up because if they're too low if I'm holding him I had difficulty getting up out of those chairs so I had to look at a variety of different things. So um, I, I didn't want to miss out on some of those things. So we had to kind of look at changing things up. And I remember the stroller was one of the biggest things because that gave me more freedom. And I was able to go out and do some walks with him a lot more than I would have with those little tiny strollers. And so those other ones that weren't as nice and friendly to my body. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, Trish, did you have um, a support from our OT? I keep thinking about our OT colleagues at ARC because you need help. There is help and there are the trained um, healthcare providers who can 
provide those supports and those adjustments. And yeah, yeah for, for listeners that um, that help is available. So did you, do, did you have to do that by yourself or did you? I had it by myself in a, until I started going and realizing, see, I was in denial for the first bit. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to say I was in denial for the first five years and I tried to push through it. And then mm -hmm. I started to have access to some education events. So I went to an arthritis self-management program. I went to a chronic pain workshop and I went to a few other things. So once I started learning a little bit more and accepting and understanding my disease, knowing that there was no cure, that it was going to progress. And I just had to figure out how to, you know, kind of halt it or slow down the progression and how to figure out how to do that, but also modify how I did it with my child and figure out what worked for me. So, you know, I got walking poles, you know, I did a whole bunch of, you know, looked at foot footwear. I looked at a lot of different things. And so I could still be active with him. So I was able to walk with him. So there was a lot of things I learned later on. And some of the things like listening to Eileen and reading her blogs and some of her things on parenting tips, I found going, oh, I wish I had that information 20 years ago because my son just turned 22 in May. So for me is if I had had those tools back then, I might have had a little bit more of an easier time of it. And I might have been able to do different activities that I wasn't able to do. So I think with these education series or wellness conversations, I think if we're able to help somebody have at least one or two little tricks or tools that they can enjoy their child and their parenting and things that might work for them you know I think that's important if I could just add to that and I think I, I you hit you hit the nail on the head that there is a lot more information and a lot more supports out there so that you know women who are going through these decisions and these experiences don't have to feel alone because like living with or dealing with um, chronic condition is very self-isolating and very lonely. So there's great blogs like Eileen's blog is such a wealth of just information and just like real life experience, right? She tells you what it is, but in the most beautiful way, women are helping each other. So you don't have to do this by yourself. So for, for anyone listening, there is a lot more, you know, again, there's a lot more evidence for safe medications and there's a lot more information and supports out there. Well, thank you. I think that's a great note to end on. I'd like to thank everyone for their participation. You have been joining us here for an arthritis wellness conversation, hearing from individuals that are just like you living with arthritis. Thank you so much. And we will see you next time. For more information and to watch additional arthritis wellness conversations, head over to arthritisresearch.ca. You know, it is really too bad that we did not continue recording after the episode came to an end because the conversation continued and was really, really amazing. We expanded on the value and the importance of being able to have conversations like this within our families and within our communities. There was also an exciting moment where Dr. Mary DeVera shared how this discussion, this conversation, in real time prompted her to consider adding an additional aspect to the research she is already doing in this area. What a great representation of the science and research being done over at Arthritis Research Canada and how they absolutely bring in the role of the patient. Thanks so much for joining me. This has been Sandra Sova. You have been listening to Chronic Wellness Radio and the Chronically Driven Podcast. See you next time. Take care and be well.